Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, warm welcome uh, to session number 13. Um, in airplanes, uh, you often miss the number 13 row, and also in hotels, uh, room 13 is often missing. You go from 12 to 14. And that's because uh, in many cultures, 13 is an unlucky number. Uh, I think that in this session, we will refute this bad reputation of the number 13 because we have a very interesting uh, program uh, ahead of us. Uh, the focus of this session is on vapor intrusion. And that is uh, one of the most complex and also most fascinating parts of risk assessment, if not the most complex and fascinating part of risk assessment. It is also an uh, extremely important uh, issue. Uh, we have to realize that uh, volatile pollutants, VOCs, they have the unfavorable combination of being mobile mobile in all directions towards the groundwater, towards the air, mobile in all directions, but also includes the most uh, toxic agents uh, produced by mankind. So I think uh, uh, we have a very important issue here by hand. Uh, some practical issues. If you have questions, you know that we don't have questions after each presentation. If you have questions, you know by now, please use the chat. In the end of the session, we have a, uh, a discussion session and we will try to include uh, your questions or your observations. And I also have a request for all the speakers to shortly introduce themselves. Uh, we have three chairmen in the ITIS session. I will start by introducing myself and then I ask the two other chairmen to introduce themselves. Uh, my name is Frank Swatjes and I'm from the National Institute of Public Health and Environment of, uh, of the Netherlands. I work on uh, contaminated sites for 35 years and I do almost every aspect that uh, has to do with contaminated sites uh, as a project manager and also as a researcher. Uh, Antonella, may I please ask you to introduce yourself? Thank you, Frank. Antonella Vecchio from uh, Institute for Environmental Protection and Research in Italy. Uh, I work uh, in the contaminated landfills uh, more than 15 years and my, I'm supporting the Ministry of the Environment with the Institute in the management of national priority list sites and uh, also together with Marco we make also research activities particularly on risk assessment and in the last uh, five years uh, on uh, in uh, vapor intrusion mainly so uh, I leave the place to Jose <laughs> to introduce okay. himself. Thank you, Antonella. Thank you, Frank. I'm Jose Gouveia, work as a project manager for environmental liabilities at Compania Siderurgica Nacional, that actually is a steel mill company, one of the largest in Brazil. And also I work as a vice president at Nicole Latin America and uh, as a leader of a technical group for vapor intrusion discussion. I'm geologist and uh, I work with contaminated sites since the past uh, 15 years. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, uh, co-chairs. Uh, Antonella, may I please ask you to announce the first speaker of this session? Okay, I will introduce Peter Buffer. I hope it's correct. Yes. Uh, from yeah. OVAM. Uh, no. That's Peter, not correct. can you introduce yourself? Yeah, Please. yeah, I'll, I'll start uh, with sharing my screen. Um, so thank you. Uh, my name is Peter Buffel. Uh, I uh, am a bioscience and environmental engineer. Uh, I work with uh, uh, ENISA team and ENISA is providing high resolution site characterization tools uh, on different project sites uh, in Europe. 
And today I will be talking about uh, an application we did with our uh, on-site measurements uh, to uh, evaluate indoor air quality uh, on the vapor intrusion impact site. I think I just uh, go on with my presentation. Uh, this project, um, this this was a recent project uh, where we've been working uh, together with uh, with Venom Boss and uh, and Ovam, which is the public uh, waste agency of of Belgium. Um, Enisa provides a high resolution site characterization tool on sites in Europe. Uh, we have developed a unique combination of the, the membrane interface probe to map VOCs in the subsurface uh, with uh, GCMS detection. And from this experience with uh, the GCMS uh, detectors on site, uh, we, we, we've got involved in, uh, in, in, in other projects where we use this, uh, this system to measure VOCs in, in this case in uh, indoor air. Uh, so in this project that we'll be talking about, we supported uh, uh, with Venom Boss uh, consultants who are working on a, on a site uh, in, in Flanders, uh, a former dry cleaning site, which was um, Hi, impacted Hi, I was doing about environment analyst, AI and machine learning state. Uh, there, I don't think we, yeah, I'll just continue. Today we're talking about vapor intrusion. Uh, I think I can assume most of you are um, completely or maybe better familiar with this topic than I am. Uh, it's not my intention to exclude extensively uh, discuss, this, discuss this phenomenon. Uh, for those looking for more, more information, uh, the website of the United States EPA have, has very eludicate uh, content on the, on the website. Uh, in short, we're talking about migration of vapor-forming chemicals into overlying buildings. This migration can occur when certain uh, chemicals like uh, VOCs, BTEX, PCE, TCE are present in the subsurface. And this kind of deterioration of the indoor air quality is one of the most important effects of uh, soil and groundwater contamination with VOCs because many VOCs are so toxic to humans, either in a chronic exposure of low levels or in acute, uh, more acute uh, when higher levels are present. Uh, in soil and groundwater investigations, the environment, environmental experts or consultants have the task to, to map this contamination, to be able to remediate the project and to remove the contaminants. Um, and the discussion about the remediation approach and the effort that has to be taken is, is based on a risk assessment. And those risks uh, are, are determined by the exposure to the contaminants. Um, and we see in, uh, in, in effective measurement of indoor air quality are often very underexposed in soil and groundwater investigations and risk uh, evaluations. And the evaluations are mostly made uh, with rather limited data and uh, rely to great extent on, on modeling. Uh, some causes might be limited attention for modeling and uh, evaluating indoor air because of little knowledge, knowledge uh, about air quality in buildings. Uh, most of us probably have more background in what happens in the subsurface than what happens into the, in the buildings. Uh, and, and maybe less knowledge about available sampling techniques and, and, and analysis methods. Correct measurement and assessment of vapor intrusion uh, can be rather difficult. On-site measurements, uh, like a handheld PID detector, for instance, can be used to evaluate VOC levels directly on site. Uh, it's relatively easy to use and very fast. However, uh, the sensitivity usually is not enough to compare to all standards or norm values. And the detection is not able to distinguish between different VOCs, uh, which is necessary to evaluate specific levels of individual contaminants. And risks and, and the risk of different VOCs and the derived standards uh, can be highly variable. Eh? For vinyl chloride, there's much more stringent standards than perchloroethylene, for instance. VOC levels uh, can also have indoor sources. Uh, and a PID is, is, is not of value in when you try to investigate, for example, PCE 
or TCE vapor infusion in, 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 in a building where there are higher levels of VOCs from stored chemicals, from tools, uh, equipment that is present. On the other hand, off-site analysis of indoor air based on sampling with patches, sorbent tube, radialos, or tetlar bags or canisters, it can deliver very sensitive detections, compound specific, uh, broad range of products, uh, but the results are average over sampling time, so they give no insight in, uh, uh, in, for example, daily variations, which can be very relevant in vapor infusion impacts. And the typical processing time between sampling and results uh, is several days, in mostly even uh, more than a week. So it makes uh, it unsuitable to implement short-term uh, actions uh, based on the, on, on the measurements. Uh, also, the sorption analysis, analysis of very volatile compounds like uh, vinyl chloride uh, with this type of uh, sorbent systems can be uh, a bit difficult. Um, now, back to our case. Uh, the project case is a former dry cleaning site. Uh, the building currently houses uh, a gym and the municipality uses the other part as a warehouse uh, and a workplace for the, the technical personnel. Uh, soil and groundwater investigation has indicated the presence of chlorinated solvents uh, underneath the building and OVAM, the Public Waste Agency of Flanders, has commissioned uh, a remediation. Uh, due to the building occupation, uh, drilling and sampling at the time of the investigation uh, studies uh, the, was a rather limited. Um, so a rather limited data set has been collected and there hasn't been much attention for indoor air measurements neither. Uh, the groundwater at the site is at uh, five or six meters below ground level and uh, the site had, will be remediated by a soil vapor extraction system that has been designed. Um, and it is when the soil vapor extraction system has been installed that the, the, the problems uh, with, with indoor air uh, concentration are revealed. So when, when, when drilling the, the, the wells for the soil vapor extraction system, PID measurements in the room indicated unexpectedly high chlorinated solvent concentrations. So additional soil samples indicated an additional source that was not discovered in the first investigation phase also because no soil gas or indoor air measurement had been performed in, in, in the building. And this triggered, uh, uh, triggered by this observation and, and, and more extensive indoor air sampling was being performed with radiellos. And in one area of the, of, of, of the building, about 2,200 micrograms per cubic meter of PCE was detected and that room was temporarily put out of use, of course. Additional measurements uh, have been taken with uh, passive samplings, um, and at every location, PCE was detected. So the, the whole uh, building needed to be uh, restricted for access for, for, for public. Um, of course, uh, the, the, the eventually the salt vapor extraction system would solve this problem, but this would take uh, a year, maybe longer. So a short term solution also was, was, was needed um, because without any mitigation, public access to the building uh, could not be allowed. A detailed indoor air investigation was performed uh, to gain more insight in the impacted parts of the building and to locate uh, respective vapor intrusion pathways. And this detailed in our investigation we did with our mobile GCMS unit that's connected to a sampling system. Uh, we developed an optimized method to en enable very fast analysis of selected VOCs. Uh, so every one or two minutes, uh, a gas sample can be analyzed. Uh, in this project, it was for perchloroethylene, trichloroethylene, uh, cis dichloroethylene, and vinyl chloride. Uh, the gas standard is used to, to, uh, to correlate these GCMS signals to, to air concentrations. And in a single field day, all parts of the buildings were investigated in detail uh, to, to, to identify the impacted areas and uh, to evaluate the presence of the individual uh, VOCs. The highest values were again found in this changing room where the levels were at that time around 1800 micrograms per cubic meter. Uh, but also in the large and open gym area, uh, the levels were around uh, 150 to 200 micrograms per cubic meter. 
And uh, even in this, this, this bigger open space, we could see, uh, we could observe a, a trend to the, to, to, the, to the corner where the, the higher impacted uh, uh, values in the other rooms were, were detected. In the, in the workplaces, concentrations range between 50 and 850 micrograms per cube. Uh, areas that were more open, concentrations were a little bit lower. Uh, also on the first floor, uh, levels were found about 70 micrograms per cubic meter of PCE. Uh, and in the, in, an, uh, in the office and next to the office in the technical room where the, the heating system was located, uh, concentrations were a lot higher because of its, it's more, more closed, uh, less ventilation, of course, uh, and, and more technical connection with, with, uh, with, uh, with the other parts of the building. Uh, also noticed, in, as also noticed in the passive sampling, uh, PCE was predominantly present and there were only two locations uh, where we also found TCE uh, but in, in, in very little amounts uh, and no further degradation products were detected on, on this side. Uh, the second part of the sampling day was used to investigate individual vapor intrusion points. Uh, it was clear, as could be expected, that several uh, perfor perforations of the concrete slab uh, were the places where the, the, the PCE, air was, uh, uh, PCE contaminated air was entering the building. So uh, all these points were screened and, and, and listed um, to be able to, to uh, take action on that. Uh, uh, the, the municipality closed most of these, uh, these points listed in the, in the investigation. Uh, meanwhile, the soil vapor extraction system was also activated. And then uh, we did a, a, a secondary measurement campaign uh, and we, we noticed uh, a, a clear drop in concentrations of chlorinated solvents in, uh, in, in the most part of the building, except for one room, all measurements had dropped below detection levels. Uh, it is not clear, however, if the, this was the most important factor in this decrease was resulting, I mean, has resulted because of the sealing of the, the, the entry points of the activation of the soil vapor extraction system. However, in one closed area, uh, still 130 micrograms per cubic meter of PCE was detected. Um, was detected in a closed space of the of the gym. Um, then we, we we went in this in, in, into this to do investigate more. Uh, when we opened the gates, uh, the levels quickly dropped because of the ventilation that, and the mixing that, and that, that can start. Um, and then we tried to to locate again the where this, uh, are, uh, these higher levels of PCE were uh, originating from. And uh, after uh, quite some investigation, we found one, uh, one uh, uh, electrical conduct where the where levels of, of about 350 micrograms per cubic meter were, were measured. And it was at the ceiling. And the, the, the electrical, the, the, the intrusion point at the floor was, was sealed, but the PVC sleeve was uh, connected through the switch box uh, with a secondary line leading to the ceiling and uh, in this in this inner tube the, the VOCs were uh, migrating uh, into this, this room. Um, several weeks later uh, also the passive sampling uh, that had been installed uh, confirmed PCE levels in the in the whole building had dropped uh, to below acceptable levels. So uh, to conclude, on-site uh, GCMS measurements can give fast on, uh, fast on-site results. More than 100 data points can be screened in one day, and the analysis yields compound-specific results that allow the comparison with individual standards and the, the differentiation between indoor and uh, between the, the vapor intrusion and other indoor VOCs. It gives you more insight in spatial and temporal variation of uh, indoor VOC levels and different automated sampling setups uh, or analytical approaches are possible uh, to also do monitoring uh, of remediation projects or long-term evaluations of vapor concentrations, uh, VOC levels in the buildings. Um, yeah, uh, this, was, this is the end of my story. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to give my uh, our, our talk here. That, um, also, thank you to, to the good co collaboration with the colleagues of WTV and BOSS and, 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 and OVAM. Uh, my contact details are on this slide. Uh, yeah, please feel free to get in touch if you need more information. Thank you.
Thanks a lot, uh, Peter, for this uh, very interesting uh, presentation and showing uh, the possibilities of DSMS measurements. Uh, it was uh, really uh, interesting what you showed here. Uh, Jose, can you please announce the next presentation? So now we will have a presentation of Mark Crane from Groundswell Technologies. Answer critical vapor intrusion questions in a single field campaign via automated continuous monitoring. Please, Mark, uh, introduce yourself. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And I am proud to also introduce my colleagues, Tom Waits from Terra, Dr. Hartman, Cliff Rescura, Christoph, also from GVV or Terra. And I'm Mark Cram, I'm a hydrogeochemist. I'm the chief scientist from Groundswell Technologies. And I'm gonna tell you about technology that is fairly similar to what Peter uh, just showed, but it uh, also has some, some significant differences. And what we're gonna show is that in a single field mobilization, you can actually answer some of these critical vapor intrusion questions. As Frank mentioned, uh, vapor intrusion is extremely complex. It's also dynamic, and that's one of the, the big uh, uh, challenges, if you will. You can have VOCs coming from uh, groundwater, from soil contamination. It travels through uh, gaps and cracks in the foundation. It can also come through sewer lines. And as Peter mentioned, there's uh, indoor products and there also can be outdoor contaminants uh, of the same constituents that you're looking for. It's much more complicated than this, uh, but due to uh, the time constraints, I'll, I'll focus a little bit here. So we've completed more than a hundred different investigations with the technology I'll be describing. And when we're asked to deploy, we start out with questions. What are the objectives? And these are driven by the questions. Is there an exceedance indoors? And if there is, is it due to an indoor source or is it really due to vapor intrusion? If an indoor source is present, can you identify where and what it is? If vapor intrusion is actually occurring, then where are the vapor entry points? When is it occurring and for how long? These are very important questions to resolve if you're gonna evaluate risk. And then what can be done to immediately reduce that risk? And I submit to you that if you understand the data patterns, the dynamic data patterns, both temporally and spatially, then you can uh, derive answers to these questions, update your conceptual site model and proceed. As Peter brought up, uh, there are a couple of vapor intrusion assessment options available. Uh, the most common are the passive approaches with canister and sorbent samples. Typically, you would bring these to the, the facility or the home and uh, you would leave it out for a, a set duration, send it to a lab, and then you get one answer uh, from that lab, which is represented as a time-weighted average. But you don't really get a pattern. Maybe you can get some spatial, but you don't really get a temporal pattern. So you can't answer many of those questions. Now, you don't have real-time feedback either. As Peter was showing, that's very useful to have that because you can make decisions on the site, on fly. Now, if you have acute risks, uh, drivers like trichloroethylene that can cause harm to an unborn fetus, uh, the time that it takes to, to get a response with a canister or sorbent is much longer than the exposure duration of concern. So you don't really prevent the exposures. And we've seen in many sites where you can get false negative and false positive results. In addition, uh, the EPA, if you read the guidance, it mentions that all decisions should be made based upon a reasonable maximum exposure. And with these types of uh, uh, options, uh, the random timing that's typically used doesn't allow you to identify the reasonable maximum exposure. Again, it's costly if you have to go back, which is pretty much guaranteed because many of those questions remain unresolved. So there are continuous analyzers. Peter described one of those. And, uh, and we're gonna describe one of those. 
Uh, now, what's beautiful about continuous analyzers is you can determine the duration of exceedance and you can see these patterns, spatial and temporal. And this is very informative to evaluate cause and effect. And it also allows you to immediately respond so that you can protect the occupants inside and reduce liabilities for the building owners. And we're doing this in a single mobilization, much like what Peter just showed. The system that we use is a customized gas chromatograph with various detectors, and we've customized it in a few ways. We've been able to get the detection capabilities down. We've been able to make it stable for very uh, long times, uh, many, many months without requiring uh, recalibration. And then we've multiplexed it. So uh, we have a valving system that we developed that allows us to collect samples automatically like a robot from up to 30 locations. And so uh, it grabs a sample, analyzes it, plus it sends it to the internet where we process the information live. And that enables us not only to visualize, but also to respond with alerts or with uh, uh, controllers. So the system is not a screening method. It's fully quantitative. It's a laboratory grade system. It's very sensitive for many of the most notorious volatile constituents. Uh, each uh, analysis requires about 10 minutes. Unlike Peter's, that takes about one to two minutes. Uh, we can cover a lot of ground uh, and a lot of space. We can do multiple buildings at the same time. We could do subsurface and indoors at the same time. It's essentially a, a modified EPA method, TO14A. Uh, you can remotely control it as well. So you, during COVID, we have a lot of projects ongoing where we're modifying things remotely, just like we're communicating remotely. Everything's on the web. The responses can be automated and you can have different rules for different responses. And what's beautiful is you can switch from monitoring mode to discrete sample mode. So if you get a hit, for instance, that was unexpected, you can go and evaluate that very quickly and while people are still in the field. Uh, we not only use it for assessment, but we also use it to optimize and confirm and protect people. Uh, but we optimize mitigation systems and, and building manipulation, ceiling cracks and things like that, that Peter just showed you. Um, evaluate whether or not uh, HVAC is having an impact or the vapor extraction is having an impact. And we also use this on remediation sites, for instance, for thermal remediation or even um, biological uh, evaluation or amendments, uh, you can have emissions of these VOCs as well as methane. Um, in fact, uh, the most common amendments will potentially lead to uh, explosion hazards. So we can uh, monitor those fugitive emissions. So here are a few images. Here's a gentleman that is laying out some of our tubing, the sample tubing. So we deploy those typically at about breathing elevation. We run the lines back to the staging area and we have a GPS coordinate for every one of those. So we know exactly where the, the samples are drawn from and where the results were derived. Here's a, a, a couple shots right here of uh, the system in the field. It doesn't take much space. That's a, a very small card table, if you will. Um, it's about the size of a microwave machine. All those tubes again connect to those locations that we're monitoring. Here's a system that I deployed where um, we rented a recreational vehicle and I shipped it out to my hotel, uh, shipped the system out, and then I rented the vehicle and converted it to a mobile lab. And we went and we rapidly screened a, a pretty good sized neighborhood with discrete samples. And then where uh, the uh, results met specific criteria, we then would park it into their driveway and then monitor either an individual home or multiple homes simultaneously for about 24 hours and look for things like range of concentration, maximum observed, cause and effect, things like that. Okay, so what does this data look like? We're looking at concentrations. We also have sensors we deploy for differential pressure across the slab. We have our own sensors that we developed for that that are wireless. Um, we also tap into the uh, either a local weather station or we can tap into the US or European or Brazilian or Australian uh, national uh, weather uh, stations and bring all that data into the dashboard. And the dashboard shows uh, data in time series, uh, contour images, moving average, and alerting. And it, it records all of that. 
And then, as I mentioned, we can trigger relays. We could even turn on a sampler. We can't analyze for every analyte of interest, but uh, if we want to use one of the analytes as an indicator, then we can trigger the opening of a SUMA canister, for instance, send that to a lab and see what other types of uh, analytes might be in that sample. Again, it's all web-based and you can also get daily reports within the dashboard by clicking on a box. So here's one of the uh, views that you might look at. I'm not going to drill too deeply in this, but essentially you're looking at a data channel. Here's trichloroethylene. This is the spatial rendering of the actual data and then moving averages and their pull down menus. So you can select what types of uh, uh, durations you want to have the data averaged over. You have time series analysis. And then you can track every time there was an exceedance of a specific threshold and it shows you when it happened, where it happened and what that value was. And all the data can be uh, uh, downloaded uh, very easily to a, a, a spreadsheet document and all the graphics you can right click on and copy and paste into reports. Okay, so I'll go through a couple of quick samples and all of these samples, uh, Previous sampling events had occurred and key questions remained. So I had to be very uh, careful which ones to select because we've got so many. If people want to learn more, I can uh, really speak for hours about some of these uh, lessons that we've learned. Now, what we uh, saw was uh, these answers that they needed were things like, is it an indoor source or is it vapor intrusion? Where's the vapor coming through the slab? Um, what's controlling the vapor intrusion? And is the mitigation system optimized? And all of these situations, we were able to resolve them very quickly with a single field mobilization. Okay, so the first one, this was a, a, a large uh, building, a military facility in the San Francisco Bay Area, where for years they couldn't tell where vapors were intruding into the building. And so we started with discrete samples with the syringe samplers I showed you a picture of before. And we came across a room that had a drain in it. And we saw that there were some uh, uh, detections of TCE at about three to four microgram per cubic meter. It was getting close to quitting time. So Dr. Hartman had a great idea. He said, let's put it in monitoring mode and let's close the doors. And then we'll go back to the hotel, have dinner, have breakfast the next day, come back. And so you can see that there was a steady rise in concentration all night. Okay, that's mass flux essentially through the slab. And so the next morning, the consultant opened up the door and the concentrations dropped when we closed it again at rose again. So we knew exactly what to do. The, consul the consultant knew exactly how to respond. That was about three years of mystery solved in about 12 hours. Here's a situation that we see quite a bit. This was a former dry cleaner and we're looking at tetrachloroethylene, barometric pressure and differential pressure across the slab. Differential pressure in our situation, if it's positive, it means the subsurface has a higher pressure than, than indoors, meaning that the earth would best basically exhale because of the pressure uh, gradient, okay? Now, what we often see here, if it's truly vapor intrusion, is when the barometric pressure drops at the surface of the earth, the subsurface does not equilibrate right away. And so there's a gradient established and you indeed have a positive differential pressure. If there are uh, VOCs in the soil pores in the shallow soil, then the, they'll be transported upwards into the building. I call this a butterfly effect. Very common, we see that quite often, where you see an increase in VOC and a decrease in barometric pressure that results in a differential pressure. We've written papers on this that I'd be happy to share with folks. So basically the barometric pressure drop either diurnally or with a storm approaching leads to differential pressure, which leads to vapor intrusion. Here's a situation where a mitigation system was installed, soil uh, vapor extraction, essentially subslab depressurization, and they tried to optimize and we're monitoring at four different locations. And we conclude unequivocally that the system was meeting the objectives because the concentrations dropped out as soon as the system was engaged. Very easy to convey that to regulators and your clients. Okay, one more I'll show. And this 
is to kind of give you an idea of the adaptive types of strategies that can be pursued in these types of situations. Uh, we call it CSI vapor intrusion. It's a, we're trying to resolve a mystery, if you will, right? So it was a retail store in Los Angeles, California. It was formerly a dry cleaner and they had tetrachloroethylene, PCE, in, indoors. Uh, the mitigation system was installed, but they continued to get hits of the PCE in many sampling rounds. So VaporSafe was brought in and we started with discrete samples. We observed that there were some elevated uh, concentrations in the floor drain. So the assumption was it's possible, the conceptual site model was it, that it was possible that the negative pressure indoors caused by the dip, uh, uh, sub slab depressurization might be drawing these through the floor drain. So we started monitoring. We were seeing the highest values at night, okay? And that was kind of curious. And so they covered the drains and we still saw the high values at night. So there went that theory. So it wasn't coming from the drains. Well, we turned off the mitigation system to see what would happen. And all of a sudden we saw that the values were very low at night. Well, that's interesting. So question, where is the tetrachloroethylene coming from? So here's some uh, stack time series where we're looking at tetrachloroethylene, differential pressure, and then I'll talk about wind speed in a bit. With the subslab depressurization on, you saw a very negative differential pressure. It was pegging our sensors. That's expected. That means that they were actually getting the suction that they needed in the subsurface. And then you see that there was a, a pretty healthy hit, okay, over 20 micrograms per cubic meter in the evening. And then when you turned it off, you no longer had that suction, and then you turned it on again and again at night, you got those hits again. Well, if you look at the wind, I started to, to, to think, you know, well, what might be happening? And if you look, when the system was on and the wind dropped below about five miles per hour, that's when you got your hit, okay? That happened these three times. But when it was off and it dropped below that speed, you did not see that hit. So we said, well, what's going on? We went up to the roof and we saw that they had the roof mounted fan, the blower system. This is where the exhaust from the subslab depressurization uh, was uh, emitting or exhausting uh, the, amend the VOCs from the subsurface. And I looked at this picture and I said, what is that? It's a roof penetration. That roof penetration was uh, to a fan in uh, a now a storage room, but it, it, it used to be a restroom, okay? And it's about one meter away from the discharge point. So they blocked that off and sure enough, the next night we did not see VOCs. So the negative pressure from subslab depressurization led to the drawing in of the PCE from the roof exhaust system, very easily resolved. We added a booster fan, extended the discharge pipe and sealed the vent. Years and years of mystery we resolved in about three and a half days of monitoring, but going through this adaptive iterative process. So in summary, this technology exists. In fact, we just started to work in Europe. Uh, we've been working in Brazil, Australia, and the United States uh, for about four and a half years with this technology. The data pattern I submit to you is the opportunity. That is like putting glasses on for the first time when the data is presented in the proper way. We can rapidly address with a single mobilization whether or not there's a risk, whether or not you have uh, urgent or accelerated exceedances for acute risk drivers like TCE, can identify indoor sources and vapor entry points. We can evaluate and optimize uh, mitigation and remediation systems. For brownfields concerns, you, instead of having to wait for a multiple rounds of samples, you can evaluate during escrow so you can expedite brownfields transactions. And we can rapidly screen through large neighborhoods by doing a combination of discrete samples and continuous monitoring. In the United States, acute exposures is a big deal. So we can actually respond rapidly, which really helps with liability and prevention of health issues. I want to thank you for your time. And uh, I also, since we're in Italy, I wanted to show you my dog Br Brunello as well.
Thank you very much, Mark, for this uh, very clear presentation. It seems to me that you not only need to know about vapor impression, but you also need detective skins to, to get all the pathways uh, that, that you need to know. Thank you very much. Uh, very interesting presentation. Uh, Antonella. Okay, uh, next presentation is uh, from Calvin Cox, uh, which uh, who will present this uh, innovative method to uh, accurately assess location and vapor intrusion potential to better define the conceptual site model. So, Craig, uh, sorry, Calvin. <laughs> so Thank, you. Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Lori Chilcote. I um, have been working in the environmental industry for what seems like my entire life. Um, and we have do a lot of vapor intrusion work. In fact, Cox Colvin is celebrating our 25th year. And my name is Craig Cox. I'm president of Cox Colvin. Um, I'm a geologist. I have degrees from Ohio State University and the Colorado School of Mines. And for the last decade, our firm has kind of focused in on uh, vapor intrusion evaluations and have helped to develop, um, in the last decade, helped to develop tools and techniques that are now used around the world. And so we'd, we'd like to present a, a, a way that we look at conceptual site models these days um, as a refreshing way to look at them. Yep, basically refine your, and we're gonna focus on vapor intrusion conceptual site models. We're gonna talk about why do we need conceptual site models, some very ineffective methods that we've come across to understand your conceptual site model, and we're gonna share two case studies, one residential and one industrial. So why do we need conceptual site models? Let's start with the concepts. What is a vapor intrusion conceptual site model? What data do you need? And what's next? So what is a vapor intrusion conceptual site model? It's basically your working theory of potential vapor issues. So you may have chlorinated VOCs, perhaps petroleum, methane, even mercury. Um, your vapor sources, you need to pay attention to what those might be. And then you know how those vapors are going to migrate through the subsurface and enter into buildings. So that could be a direct uh, intrusion from soil vapor, or it could be a long preferential pathways. And who are the potential receptors, whether it be residential or commercial, and how you're going to address those? Lots of data sources to get your information from. And in the past, we've kind of looked at it from a groundwater standpoint, mostly, or a soil standpoint. But really, if you're going to do vapor intrusion assessments, you need to have vapor data. So that's going to be sub-slab or external soil gas data or indoor air or ambient air data is, is the most important. There's plenty of regulation and guidance to look for. Um, you know, groundwater data is a, sor is a source of data, but I put a question mark next to that because you have to be very cautious about how you use that data. And I think Guillerme uh, in the last uh, session noted that, that uh, you know, it was originally thought to be a groundwater problem, but then they proved that really the groundwater was sort of a red herring and kind of threw them off. Right. And you'll have some soil classifications, historical aerial photography, and site maps. Yeah, and historical aerial photography, including that in a GIS when you're evaluating your site, is a very useful uh, way to look at sites because a lot of these uh, VOCs were released uh, before there was regulations. And so you have, it's important to know what the building shape was and stuff like that back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, but don't forget about your preferential pathways and avoid limiting your COC list those things can yep. get you in trouble. So let's take a quick look at what a, what a typical uh, conceptual site model is now. Basically it's broken into two parts. There's the subsurface, so you have contamination in, in contaminated soil or contaminated groundwater or a sewer line that's, that's uh, failing or some kind of thing like that. And then it migrates up into the indoor airspace. And so that's the second half of the model. One of the things you have to be cautious of is the indoor air sources. So there will be indoor air sources in every investigation. You just have to be prepared to uh, evaluate those. So what's next is that what the way we look at these conceptual site models now is we actually use them as GIS systems and plot data directly back to the model so that we can uh, see how the concentrations relate visually uh, because it's a lot of complicated data to look at. And we'll, we'll show you this in a, in a case study. 
So let's talk about some of all the methods that you can use to really refine your conceptual site model. Again, you need to expand your COC list. If you're looking at a chlorinated site, make sure your list includes cis DCE. Uh, this compound generally occurs as a degradation of TCE in the environment, and it doesn't occur in commercial products. So if you see that in your indoor air, it's a good indicator that you have vapor intrusion. Uh, sewer gas constituents, uh, we're finding that sewer gas is the preferred preferential pathway at, at this point, and uh, you want to add to your COC list some brominated compounds, chloroform, tetrahydrofuran, and maybe even ACT and high resolution sampling. It's very important all the data that you're going to accumulate to be able to do that and in the field and be able to make decisions. Those reliable PIDs are very helpful so you can make decisions in the field and using tools that you can do readily available such as the vapor pen so you can install samples right away and take them and get them um, onto your CSM as well as multiple lines of evidence. Consider all your potential pathways it's important to collect differential pressure and consider weather data and seasonal variations as well. Another thing to do is take a visual interpretation of, of your data in different ways. Uh, this is a look at some sewer gas uh, data that we had. We wanted to get a feel for how much of the, of the data that we collect is actually impacted by the sewer. And so we plotted PCE, TCE, and the sewer gas indicators on this trilinear plot for indoor air, soil gas, and sewer gas. And when we zoom into the side of the triangle that's dominated by sewer gas, you know, rightly so, we see all of our sewer samples show up there. But we also saw that there was a lot of sub-slab soil gas data and indoor air data that was dominated by sewer gas compounds. So that led us to believe that we were actually collecting a lot more sewer gas data than we think. And use your conceptual site model, like we're saying, plot your data on. You get a lot of um, high resolution data. It's easier to interpret if you can visual it, visualize it and as well as yourself and your clients. And then back to the G, uh, using the GIS for historical data sources. This is a, a dry cleaner site in central Ohio that we looked at. Uh, the green triangle or the green rectangle in the middle of the photograph is where the current uh, dry cleaners located. But when we look back at uh, historical data, we found that it actually started out as that red square in a house. Uh, then it was moved to the red red rectangle at the other end of the building before it, it, it uh, came at this place. So uh, if you just went to the, the dry cleaner today and started to monitor that situation, you'd probably miss the biggest VOC issue that's the red square that's in the parking lot prior to any kind of regulatory. You'd overlook the entire story, the real yeah. story of it. So we're going to do some case studies, um, industrial and residential, and we're going to start with industrial first. So there was a source of vapor intrusion in a 60,000 square foot building, and the previous consultant had evaluated it for two years. They knew there was a source, but they were unable to locate it and provide that accurate conceptual site model. The, the, the client was ready to move on. They were ready to build out. And so they, they asked us, and they said, we need you to find out where this source is. Keep in mind, the yellow triangles are the previous consultants where they took the soil borings and the red circles are monitor wells. Notice there's no soil gas samples. So Cox Colvin went in and installed, screened, sampled, and abandoned 90 vapor pen sampling points in two days. We used a reliable PID for screening purposes. Um, and when we took, our, we took a soil gas sample at every point, but we used a field screening tool, so it was very inexpensive. This is the PCE, and you can see how well it correlates with the PID. They didn't have any TCE issues. They did um, have some TCA. So we were accurately able to give them where the source was within a week, allowing those mitigation efforts to proceed and providing them with a conceptual site model. Again, the groundwater data that they took did not take them to where they needed to be because they were not taking soil gas samples. This case study is a, a, a home in, um, in a neighborhood that we, we did an investigation on that we were asked to come in and evaluate the data. And I'll, I'll take you through that. It was a lot of houses in a, in a big neighborhood. Um, what we're gonna look at is the data that's, that we have and it's PCE, TCE in red, 
uh, TCA in light blue and CIS in yellow. And I'll give you an indication of the kinds of data we collected and, and how we interpreted that. So here's our... And that was the first list that the client wanted us yes. to start with. Yeah. And so here's our, our um, absolute concentrations of those uh, compounds at, at various sampling locations. We had two ambient air samples, one upwind and one downwind. We had a deep soil gas uh, sample that was collected adjacent to the house. We had a soil or sewer gas sample that was collected from a clean out, but for visualization, we placed that down in the sewer just so we'd better understand that. Uh, and protect people uh, faster. Uh, we are recommending using, at least for the screening, the uh, US EPA attenuation factors uh, while we are developing California specific ones. Uh, we are recommending to air investigation they are considered and include both co-located sub-slab indoor air and uh, outdoor air samples to have a, a good picture of what's going on and making decision for current risk based on indoor air and future risk based on subsurface data, uh, data because buildings can change over time. Um, I'm more than happy to answer questions during the panel discussion later. Thanks a lot, Claudio, for giving uh, insight in the screening of buildings for vapor intrusion in uh, California. It uh, was a very interesting presentation. And indeed, we might come back with some questions uh, in a minute in the panel discussion. Uh, but first, we have uh, one final presentation. Uh, Antonella, may I please ask you to announce the final presentation of this session? Thank you, Frank. Uh, I will introduce uh, Duncan Phillips, uh, uh, which will um, have a more, an interesting presentation on this uh, actual COVID uh, problem uh, and what is related to uh, ventilation in uh, our houses. So it's a very actual issue. So Duncan. Good afternoon. Ah, oh, sorry, what's Chiara? Sorry. <laughs> okay. I forgot. No problem, I forgot. no problem at all, Antonella. That's okay. Um, okay. Yes, thank you for introducing uh, Duncan for us. I am uh, Chiara Pozzuoli, Regional Manager and um, responsible of the Italian Office of RWDI. And I am pleased uh, to introduce you to the topic of uh, our presentation that uh, is going to be delivered by Duncan Phillips. Duncan couldn't be available today, unfortunately, uh, but is going to be uh, online in this um, recorded uh, video. We also have uh, with us uh, our um, senior expert uh, on performance ventilation strategies, uh, Mike Carl, who's going to be uh, with me in the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. So I'm going to launch uh, our presentation. Please let me know if uh, you, you cannot hear well or see it well. Thank you. Hello, my name is Duncan Phillips. I'm the Global Practice Leader for Building Performance, Ventilation and CFD at RWDI. My apologies, I can't be in uh, person at this conference. It turns out I'm double booked on conferences, but by through the magic of the internet, I'll be presenting to you uh, on the ventilation design to reduce risks for the built environment. And my colleagues will be available during question and answer period to, to discuss this and, and engage in the, uh, in the conversation. Before I get started, it's important to me that you know that I have the privilege of working with a uh, group of very intelligent people at RWDI. They teach me things every day and we get to work on some very interesting projects for entire inspired clients. Um, in terms of an outline, this is what we'll be talking about. There'll be a brief overview or background on the transmission of COVID. Industrial ventilation perspective. And then we'll talk about some challenges to managing COVID-19, types of ventilation systems, and then options to reduce risk and some future considerations. So in terms of uh, transmission of COVID-19, um, it, it is, no one disputes this, but COVID-19 is spread through respiratory droplets. And those are the ones that come out of your mouth when you're coughing, sneezing, talking, singing, things like that. What is disputed is whether or not and how 
the relative importance of the droplets in, in the way in which they infect people. Is it from direct contact where my sneeze lands directly on someone? Is it indirect where my sneeze lands on a surface and then someone touches the surface and then brings it to their eye? Or is it through airborne and they float around and they land on someone afterwards? And it's those three different mechanisms that people are just still debating as to which is the most important. Regardless, no one disputes the fact that it's a respiratory droplet. So those are the ones that are released from the, from the mouth when coughing, singing, and so on and so forth. And of course, if you think about it, there are many, many droplets in the built environment. Here are four uh, sort of cited here, everything from playgrounds to cooling towers and the animation on the upper left, sorry, the upper right, is, a, is rain penetration as it falls around a building. And of course, then there are the respiratory droplets. And you get a sense in that image of just what the range of sizes are as they come out of our mouths. And that range of size is important because it then talks about the droplet's ability to, to travel around a space. What you're looking at here is uh, an equation for the terminal velocity of water, a water droplet. Um, the bottom velocity in meters per second. And you'll note that CD, that uh, drag coefficient, is very important. It actually varies on the basis of the size of the particle. But if we actually look at the, the um, how that varies over uh, the different droplet sizes, here's a range of droplets going from um, submicron all the way up to millimeter. And um, droplet sizes between 50 and 500 microns are associated with mist. Um, greater than one millimeter are rain. 50 microns, 50 um, uh, micrometers are uh, the smallest particle that we can see. And those respiratory droplets run the range of about 0 0.6 to 1,000 uh, micrometers. Um, and then if we start looking at what is inhalable, that's anything less than 100 microns, but something that is respirable, something that can get into the lungs, um, that's on the order of uh, 10 microns or less. And then SARS-CoV-2, the particle that causes COVID-19 is approximately 0.12 microns, um, but research is suggesting that it's sticky and it may actually latch on to, um, to other particles or to dust. Maybe earliest pieces of work thinking on this was Wells, and he developed uh, some thinking to describe the transmission of diseases. And his thought was that if we have different droplets and they have a different experience in space. Some of them will evaporate and some of them will evaporate before they hit the ground, whereas others um, may actually touch the ground. And that's the difference between this side of the curve and this side of the curve. Now, uh, Wells' uh, thinking and research was bang on, but some of the numbers were were quite right. And this work was redone in 2007, my group, and they came up with these curves. And the red line that I've shown here is the original Wells number. Um, and these other curves represent uh, the either the evaporation, time to evaporate, or the time to hit the ground for different relative humidity. So here, this one here is 50% relative humidity. What's important to note is that there are an awful lot of droplets that are produced through sneezing, coughing, talking, and there are different size ranges. And here you can sort of see the difference. And when we talk about sneezing, it is hundreds of thousands of droplets. When we're talking coughing, it's tens of thousands. Um, and, and remember, for, from the Wells or the Shiat et al. work that I showed on the previous slide, anything less than about 100 microns is not going to hit the ground at, at typical temperatures and relative humidity of about 50%. Anything that was smaller than that size will evaporate, um, and the, the, any particle that was inside that uh, uh, droplet is now free to float in air. So this starts to become very important in that um, when we have tens of thousands of droplets released during a sneeze, we may have many, not tens of thousands, but many small particles that might uh, still be floating around space. So now let's talk about ventilation configurations. And I've sort of listed three here. There, there are others, but these are primary uh, ones that I want to talk about. Uh, there's displacement, which is the top one. In displacement ventilation, what goes on is we introduce the air low, it's, it's at a low velocity, and we try not to mix the air at all um, in the space, and then plumes from uh, people and from equipment lift contaminants up and out. The second one down is mixing, and it's almost the opposite. And what we do here is we introduce air uh, as vigorously as we can, usually at the ceiling level, um, and stir the room up. And, and this type of environment is characterized by um, uniformity of conditions where displacement ventilation, the previous one, is characterized by strong gradients where we may have a low temperature at the bottom rising up uh, as we get towards the ceiling. And then the final one is uh, this UFAD or underfloor air distribution. And in the UFAD system, what happens is 
um, that we introduce the air at the ground level. It is injected fairly rapidly into the occupied zone, but we encourage it to mix very quickly within the occupied zone. And when it does that, it creates uniform conditions in the occupied zone. And then we allow the rest of it to rise up into the uh, space above people's heads. And so what happens here is we've got a well-mixed condition in the occupied zone and then a stratified layer above. So if we think about uh, what, what SARS-CoV-2 means and, and the transport of COVID-19, the droplets that we are concerned about can re be released any and everywhere. And so when we start talking about offices and we're really trying to figure out how do we minimize risk there or industrial environments, in both cases, there are different types of risks in this the office space maybe the ventilation rate isn't particularly high because they don't need it, the codes don't require it. Whereas maybe in the industrial environment, it might be slightly noisier, so people are lead needing to talk louder and be closer to one another, so that then what ends up happening is they're a higher risk because of that a different way in which they interact. So when we think about industrial pollution control, we use a layered approach. And the, and the first layer in this three steps, and I'm sort of divided into three, is one in terms of protecting people from contaminants. If you can't eliminate the source completely, then you remove the occupant from the presence of the source. And sometimes that might be industrial process control, sometimes that may be distancing and other things. And then the last thing in the background is good general. It doesn't matter whether or not we're an industrial facility or we're in an office space or a school, um, we have a multiple layers of multiple com complications. And the first one is we don't know where the source is. The source can be everywhere, um, and it can be anyone. Some buildings um, are very densely occupied with people. Think about transit stations, but also think about elevators where people spend short amount of time, but in a dense, uh, densely packed environment. And then lastly, for, for what we're trying to deal with now, the building systems are already dis constructed. So we already have the ventilation systems. And the last complication is, and this doesn't, can't be emphasized enough, is uh, we, we don't know what the, the virus looks like in terms of who has it. Uh, because people who are pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic, and I'm distinguishing the two there, um, can also release the, vi um, the virus. That's different from something like SARS, which was uh, the epidemic in 2003. That one, um, you weren't, um, you weren't uh, uh, infectious if you didn't have any symptoms. So ASHRAE, which is one of the organizations um, dealing with offering guidance on ventilation systems, uh, which is similar to RIVA, uh, was concerned that people were turning the ventilation systems off. They were concerned that people were seeing this as a problem. And there, there were, and part of that was because there were reports that people were saying that the HVAC system is spreading the virus. And that, that wasn't quite fair and wasn't quite reported well, a bit sloppy on the reporting. Um, so what the guidance is from uh, ASHRAE and RIVA and other organizations is sort of don't turn the system off, keep it running 24 seven, set the relative humidity level at uh, between 40 and 60%, make sure your filters are working properly and then purge, just leave the system running. Um, and SIBC uh, in the UK, which is part of Reva, is using that advice. Um, the AI uh, RAH, which is on Australia, is using advice from ASHRAE and ISHRAE in India. And so there's lots of advice that tends to be consistent. But unfortunately, none of this is really addressing the room air distribution. So how is air moving around the room? Most of this is talking about the systems. So we really need to talk about the space that we're all in because we're sharing air within occupied spaces. So just what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some computational fluid dynamics to show you the way in which room air moves about. Uh, the first thing to note is don't believe everything you see when you're using CFD. I prefer the bottom one there, creative fictional diagrams. What we're doing with CFD is we're taking a space and here it's an operating room and we're applying a bunch of physics and the modeling and mathematical modeling of that physics um, through discrete volumes that we call cells, and then we're generating results. Notice that an image like this isn't necessarily what was simulated. Uh, in the case of that picture, it came from a model that looked like this. The results look like this, but we're able to fancy it up and make it look like that. So just always be careful about how you're reviewing a CFD result because they may not always be what you think they are. Um, that said, I'm going to present some CFD, and it's for a small meeting room or an office or a waiting room. It can be a variety of different things. It could also be a small manufacturing facility. Uh, this could be people sitting around a table doing textiles. So this. In this particular case, I have an infectious occupant. And really what we're doing is sort of looking at what happens when the people in there are quiescent. There's one person who's ill, and we, we want to look at the different types of ventilation systems we have, mixing, displacement, and underfloor. Other configurations are possible, we're going to talk about those three. And so for the mixing system, I've got ceiling-based diffusers. 
For the underfloor, sorry, yes, for the underfloor system, I've got uh, swirl diffusers in the floor. There are five of them. And then for the displacement system, I have corner diffusers pushing air in from the corners. And all I'm trying to do on this slide is note that the age of air at the occupied level is about right. Um, and what I want to draw your attention to is the way in which this plume here spreads around the space. And what you'll note here is that a dilution of 500, so if I had 10,000 droplets released through a sneeze, this would mean that any, anywhere in this space has at least 20 droplets in one volume that's breathed in. And the mixing system is spreading this around the room. When I go to the underfloor system, what's happening is it's only spread it around part of the room, and that's because of the way the underfloor system works. And when I go to the displacement system, it is lifting the contaminants up and out. And I should note that this is an idealized displacement system. Not all will work this way, but it does, is ind indicative of what we can sort of strive to achieve in a displacement system. And so when we look at different parameters like age of air, we sort of note that the age of air is about right. Um, the mixing system is, is slightly staler um, in the occupied zone. The underfloor air distribution system and the displacement system have better or lower um, aged air in the system. The real of stale air here is simply because it's a dead zone. But when we sort of go and compare that 500 dilution level, remember this is when there's 10,000 droplets in the space, um, you can see the differences between them. And this is now important about what kind of other mechanisms we can provide to, to manage or control and clean the air. And so there are a lot of technologies being described and used uh, for cleaning air. Some are quantifiable, like upper room UVGI, in-room filtration or, or filtration within ducts. Some technologies are new, like uh, FAR UVC, which is um, purported to be a safe um, uh, UVC uh, wavelength for humans. And then some are uh, hard to, to validate, but they're getting popularity like uh, bipolar ionization. Uh, we're even hearing about dry hydrogen peroxide. One has to be careful with any of these because if done poorly, they can produce dangerous byproducts. And so what we're trying to do here, back to those images as a, as a reference point, is to just note that if I have a mixing system and I have um, a, mic, uh, a filter system down low, or I have upper room UVGI, because this is a mixing system, this will get distributed around the room. And the benefits of the upper room UVGI or the mix or the filtration down here will be lent to the entire room. Whereas if I go to up, uh, UFAD, where I'm introducing the air down low, and then I've got a stratified layer up above, um, anything we do in the upper room isn't useful because that's not going to come back down into the room. The whole point of an upper underfloor air distribution system is that the, this, the air above us doesn't come back down. So anything we do above people's heads won't help. So in this case, um, we need to make sure that any in-room filtration or other devices in this space don't destroy or break up the stratification layer. If it does, then it's actually not useful. And then when we talk about displacement system, the cleaning systems that we put in there may actually cause a problem in that it may break up the stratification layer. So if you recall, displacement ventilation allowed us to lift up and out those particles, but if I put in a, something that's going to stir that up and break the stratification layer, it may actually completely negate the benefit of a displacement system. So upper room UVGI isn't really helpful because that air is not going to come back down to ground. And if I put a filter, fan filter system down here um, to take out particles, that may actually break up the air distribution. So in closing, a uh, few thoughts. Simple measure of bulk airflow through a space is not a measure of safety. Airflow patterns in the room dictate how contaminants are transported around the room. And we need to take care of that in terms of measuring the, uh, the exposure levels to occupants. Um, the location, supply, and exhaust become very important in understanding where heat sources are, because that affects the dis uh, dispersion around the room. And air changes prior as a design rule doesn't acknowledge the different transportation paths. It oversimplifies it. And as we get back to sharing spaces, the ventilation system should help protect us, but we need to think about how we do it. So in terms of COVID-19, the things to think about, we probably need to consider how to get that fresh air into the breathing room, uh, breathing zone better. Um, the idea of cleaning air within a room is a good idea, but we have to do that properly. An industrial pollution three steps. Source control, which is masks. Reduce the risk, which is social distancing, and then provide good general ventilation. And that's about, we need to do a better job of adding, uh, doing more of it outside air. Thank you very much for your time. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, uh, Duncan and Guillera, for this uh, uh, impressive uh, presentation. Very impressive. Uh, I learned a lot from it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's you. time to go to the panel discussion. We have uh, something like half an hour, which is quite an, a nice uh, time frame to have a good discussion. 
uh, I propose to start with uh, Peter. And I look at my co-chair if Antonella or Jose has a question for Peter, maybe. Else uh, I can start, but if you have something, please. Yes, I have a question to Peter. How many samples did you take in the indoor air with, the, with your system for assessing the, the preferential pathways for vapor intrusion? What do you mean? How many samples we did in this at this site? Yeah. It was about uh, 100 measurement points. Okay. I like to know, Peter, um, this question I actually could ask to most of you, but I ask it uh, uh, from you. Um, is it that difficult to eliminate the indoor, uh, to identify the indoor air sources? Uh, because that, of course, is a very important issue if you have indoor air sources for vapor uh, intrusions. Uh, isn't that difficult? You, I, but what do you mean exactly to, to, to identify, differentiate? To identify the indoor sources for vapors. Because that's always mentioned as a problem. We have vapors in our soil and groundwater. Yeah. But the measurements, the indoor air measurements, are impacted by indoor air sources. Yeah. And the question is, are, is it that difficult to identify the indoor air sources? I don't think so. Uh, definitely, when you measure individual VOCs, you can. You. Um, I don't think there are many sources of, of, of uh, for instance, chlorinated solvents indoor. Right? There might be some some degreasing products, uh, some some, uh, but I think you can uh, easily identify those when you're in 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 the in the area. You can see the different types of uh, of, of cans that are that are stored in, in in a workplace, and you can you can try to see what's uh, what, what what type of products that are in in there. So. Uh, I, I, I think I think I don't think it's that difficult. Okay. Uh, one other question about I was a little bit surprised about the electoral conduct that that was a problem. Uh, do, do do you have the same idea that it's a little bit uh, far sought actually? Did you expect? Wasn't that a surprise? Let me put it like that. No, no, I don't think so. It's it's just a place where there where there is a connection between the the, the sub slab area be below the building and the and the, uh, and, and the, the indoor area. So it was a, a double walled uh, tube. So uh, yeah, it, it's just a, a way where the, there is there is a possibility for for, for vapors and for gases to to to, trans, to, to transport and. And how did you find out? By, by just logical, logical uh, thinking about it? Or did you make a measurement on the conduct? Or how did you find yeah, out? Yeah, we, we measured. We, we, we did a lot of measurements uh, at each, uh, at all locations where we saw there is a, a, a perforation of the, of the, of the, the concrete floor, or cracks or, or, yeah. or, or conducts are, are coming from the subsoil. Uh, and we did measurements. Uh, yeah. OK. Any other questions for Peter from the chairs or from maybe one of the other participants? There was one question at the yeah. chat, I think, for Peter. Um, let me see what it was. Yeah, um, it's, it's from Craig, actually, from one of the presenters today. Uh, Peter? Uh, yeah, have I, you didn't, you saw yeah I, saw the, I saw the question. Yeah. Okay, uh, okay, yeah. If you had used the flux chamber uh, to get an idea of entry of VOCs through the intact slab, uh, we didn't have the opportunity to use it. I'm very curious, uh, but uh, yeah, I, I haven't used it. Uh, but I know I know it's been uh, this type of uh, flux chambers are, are are popping up more and more. I would be very curious to see what 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 kind of uh, VOC measurements we could uh, have with that, but I won't expect them to have very high concentrations. I think that's more a very diffuse, lower concentrations that, that is a continuous flow. Uh, so, yeah, 
I, I'm not sure if you, if we would be able to to have a positive uh, protection with uh, flux chambers, uh, but it depends on, on on the site. I think might might be some sites where the where you're really at the source and the the, the product has been really been into the the, the 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 concrete that might be a potential source where there might be high fluxes uh, you could detect in that way okay thanks uh, a lot uh, peter for this uh, reply uh, let's skip to mark mark are you ready for some questions uh, sure tonella or jose any questions for mark uh, i have a question on how many um, uh, monitoring points can you sample with your uh, gas analyzer? How many sampling stations you can continue monitoring? Thank you for that. Typically, we're looking at 16 sample locations, and they can be up to 300 meters from the instrument. Uh, but we also have situations where we can Beowulf two devices or use a different valve and we can go up to 30, uh, uh, have up to 30 ports. Sometimes we'll also dedicate one or two ports to a standard so that every cycle will run a standard for quality control as well. Thanks for that question. Impressive number. <laughs> so. And Mark, um you 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 did your measurements uh, you, you you actually didn't mention season um of course there is a large impact if you do all this whole measurements program in summer or winter uh can you can you tell something about that uh, the impact of season and, and 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 how did you deal with that how do you deal with that in general that's a great question frank i actually believe that while the season can have an impact, it's not as important as having upward advective flux conditions. More specifically, if the barometric pressure drops or you have wind shear or uh, you have HVAC operating that creates a, a negative pressure relative to the subsurface, I think that is far more important than season. Um, and uh, we have demonstrated that with many different uh, situations. So for instance, in California during the winter time where based on some of the Johnson work in Utah, uh, it's assumed that you have a higher uh, potential for higher concentration in the winter. We actually can get a high pressure. We call it a Santa Ana condition in Southern California. If you have a high barometric pressure, atmospheric pressure, the flow is gonna be downwards towards the soil not upwards. So you can actually underestimate the, uh, the reasonable maximum exposure. But it probably very much depends on where you are in the world, eh? the difference between the seasons, eh? right? It's You're talking now for does. your part of the world probably, is that right? Yeah. I agree. It, it, uh, it depends on the, I think every uh, location and every building is like a snowflake. It's very unique. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Also, also the Johnson calculations, they're also done in, I think it's in the southern part of the United States eh, with a relatively uh, small difference between the, client, the winter and the summertime maybe. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Okay, uh, I actually have one more question for you if I may, Mark. Sure. Uh, that's a question I always would like to ask because I never really understand it. You, you, you said something about false negatives and false positives. I can very well understand false negatives that you, you try to measure something, you don't measure it. How do you explain false positives? How do you do that? Thank you for that. Uh, and this actually relates to another question that you had for Peter, um, where you asked about whether or not we can distinguish between vapor intrusion and indoors and identify the location of indoors. Uh, we've gone to many sites where uh, expensive mitigation had already been uh, either recommended or installed, and it wasn't a vapor intrusion issue at all. There was an indoor source. Ah, okay, yeah, now I got it. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Sure. Um, yes, I have um, 
uh, a question also to Mark, because uh, you analyzed very well that the uh, interdependency of the barometric pumping or barometric differential pressure, the wind, the building configuration. So very impressive, the fact that the, the contaminant came from the roof, so <laughs> uh, up <laughs> from uh, uh, upwards to downwards. And, but mm, as also Claudio remarked in his guidelines, we have also to forecast what will happen if a new building will be built on a contaminated soil. So um, it, it is uh, possible to forecast more or less what will happen in order to identify the real remediation needs if the building is not there. Yes, so uh, we can lay down uh, plastic sheeting or vis queen, and we've done this before, and then we can um, insert tubing in specific locations, and we can monitor both the subsurface as well as that interface between the plastic sheeting and the top of the soil, and we can track the climatic as well as a differential pressure, and we can see where hot spots might uh, occur, and then during the construction, you can, uh, you know, adjust your design for that, or you might be able to remediate or mitigate prior to construction. So uh, that that's definitely possible, particularly if you're monitoring over a time when a, an a, a storm is approaching. That's actually the most critical time where you have the largest differential pressure. Thanks a lot, Mike. Uh, I think we can uh, move to uh, Laurie and Craig for some questions. Uh, Laurie and Craig, when we knew that you had this uh, combined uh, presentation, it would have been nice when all three of our chairs also would have a combined question for you. <laughs> but, uh, at forehand, so you have to do it with some individual questions. Uh, if I may start with a question, um, I was fascinated by your THF um, uh, conclusions. Eh? You, you included that, and what was it? A half life of 30 minutes, or what? Yes. Yes. Yeah, half life yeah. 30 minutes, yes. What, what is your advice about THF? Is it, is it useful or even necessary to include in your measurement program, or is it difficult because of these limited half life times? Um, I think it's important to include because we do see it in almost every sewer investigation that we do. Uh, we see THF at really pretty high concentrations. Uh, but again, if you're collecting um, in the restrooms, you probably have the fan running at that, at that collection point. So you're kind of increasing the ability for vapor intrusion to happen. So you're kind of getting fresh uh, THF coming in from the sewer. It hasn't been in the atmosphere very long. Um, that could, uh, Claudio brought up uh, right after my presentation, he sent a little note to me, you know, is, is it actually exhausting it at the same time? Maybe that's not why you're seeing it in the living space. Um, and that could be. Uh, I think the, the other part of that equation, though, is we did see the other uh, sewer gas indicators like PCE in the main living space. So there was some interaction between the, the restrooms and the living space and the, the THF either went out the, by the fan or degraded on the way to another location. But it's, it's uh, surprising how much of that we see in sewers um, across the United States anyways. Yeah. But isn't it extremely impractical with this low, uh, with this high degradation rates? Um, well, we, we we're able to detect it. Uh, mm -hmm. So if we, if it was degrading, uh, faster, we wouldn't be able to detect, but we, we are very uh, successful at detecting it in both the indoor, mm -hmm. if, if you're near a sewer line break, or if you're actually collecting a sewer gas sample. Okay. I mean, and especially they've been replacing a lot of sewer lines here in the U.S. because yeah. of the, you know, the breakdown and they're no longer viable. So, I mean, think about it. That's your preferential pathway when you have an industrial site that they're dumping something down the drain and now it's just going right down the sewers, which is, can be a lot of problems. And that's why it's important to really differentiate what's coming from where. Some more questions for Craig uh, and Lori from the chairman or from the other speakers. Uh, or maybe I, have a, I have a question for Craig and Lori. 
compliments for your combined presentation. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank yeah, you. And, and mm, you suggest to uh, analyze these uh, sewer uh, compounds uh, also in industrial sites, industrial commercial sites, or only in residential area? Um, I think you should consider it for every site you look at. Um, now, there, it is a little difficult to convince your client that they should investigate uh, the sewer gas because uh, it, it makes the the area of investigation much larger uh, and almost immediately because now your you know sewer gas can move <laughs> every which way and laterally and and so now a small neighborhood that maybe has impacted groundwater underneath it becomes ten times larger when you start to evaluate the sewer line impacts and how the sewer lines are able to transport uh, vapors. Um, we, we actually worked on a site where the sewer lines were replaced and we went back in and collected um, samples post replacement and found that the concentrations actually got higher uh, for chlorinated solvents and included uh, cis 1,2 DCE. And so that was the kind of, that was the, the presence of that compound in the sewer lines from, you know, pretty far away. Uh, the only way it could get in there is from a source, uh, you know, from a, a groundwater source or a soil source. And we located it back to the treatment system for the groundwater uh, treatment system was an air sparge and soil vapor extraction system that then went through uh, a building that had an outlet to the sewer for water to go out to the sewer. And the concentrations within that building of CIS 1,2 DCE were high enough that it every once in a while went down through the into the sewer and then it expanded throughout the neighborhood almost immediately. So, almost like the top vent at the building. Yeah. <laughs> Going down. Yeah, and yeah. It, 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 origi it originally had been uh, okay, but then they wanted to put uh, carbon on the end of the treatment system so that they could polish the you know the effluent from the treatment system and that back you know that back pressure of the carbon was enough to cause then those vapors to run into the sewer mm -hmm. so it was a very difficult thing to sort out but thank you very much thank you thanks a lot uh, Craig and uh, and uh, Laurie um, I think we can move to uh, Claudio and I'd like to start with a uh, question that was put on chat. Uh, did you see your question yourself, uh, Claudio, or do you want me to read it? Uh, I did not see the question, uh, so yeah. if you uh, read it, that would be better for me. No, I will help I'm you. scrolling and I don't see it, uh, actually. I will, I will help you. The question is uh, also from one of our speakers, Mike Cram. And Mike asks you for large shallow groundwater plumes, would you recommend evaluating indoor air before engaging in a soil vapor survey that might delay response? Well, uh, again, it depends. Uh, for, uh, Mark knows very well, for example, in areas like uh, the San Francisco Bay area where the uh, groundwater is very, very shallow, we are talking uh, a couple of meters uh, uh, or less, you know, basically I would uh, uh, recommend considering going directly to the indoor air whenever you think that the so exterior soil gas may not be representative of what is below the building can be groundwater, can be other conditions. Uh, so again, uh, the uh, shallow groundwater, uh, you know, you're much more prone. If you're near a coastal area, that could be, uh, you know, you have also tidal influences that can uh, increase uh, pumping. So again, it is a site specific decision. Uh, shallow groundwater will be a, a very good information to have in terms of concentration of these contaminants. But yeah, that, that could uh, uh, certainly uh, be a uh, value. Okay, thank you. And then Mark has another question for you also on chat. Uh, I will read it again for you. Uh, if we observe no risk even during conditions conductive to vapor intrusion, e.g. upward advective flux, 
would it still be necessary to repeat the campaign during a different season? Interesting question. So uh, basically you have, uh, let me understand uh, Mark and uh, you, you can uh, explain a little better uh, after I ask you back the question. So you have subsurface uh, uh, concentration uh, that are you know enough to trigger an indoor air investigation but nothing in the indoor air. Is that a situation you're describing? It would be not only uh, not seeing a, a, a concentration of uh, that exceeds a threshold, but also during conditions where, for instance, you have differential pressure that would suggest upward flow. Okay. Um, again, uh, I would uh, uh, see. It depends uh, how big is the concentration in the subsurface. Uh, and uh, whether the design of the building would, uh, uh, you know, if you turn on the uh, heating in the winter, would it create an advective uh, 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 flow that you did not consider, for example, in the summer when you have the AC that is creating positive pressure towards the inside. That goes to the building design. It, again, it's a size specific. Whenever you have an in subsurface source that's significant enough to trigger an indoor air uh, investigation, I would at least repeat it under, I, you know, seasonal is a very uh, general term. You know, as you were pointing out in California, maybe seasons are very different than uh, in, um, in Ohio or other regions, but even within California, for example, if you are in the San Diego area where it's nice weather, it's different uh, from uh, up in Tahoe where in the winter you have a nice layer of snow that, that would prevent uh, vapor migration and uh, have different dynamics. So that can be different as well. So yeah, the short answer is yes, I would recommend uh, a second round of samples uh, under different conditions can be, you know, a wet season versus dry season, heating season versus uh, cooling season, not necessarily spring versus winter or things like that. It's more about the exterior condition. And going back to something you mentioned earlier, wind. Uh, wind can be an important factor. And when you were talking about the influence of wind in uh, getting uh, flux inside of the uh, building you are investigating. Did you notice a difference uh, uh, if uh, the wind, the direction of the wind uh, was uh, hitting the part of the building with a lot of openings or they, where there were uh, uh, not as many openings? I'm thinking about that the work that uh, one of the postdoc in Kelly Panel's uh, group did a few years ago, in which you actually had opposite uh, effects whether they uh, pre predominant wind is, is hitting where you have a lot of windows and doors which increase dilution compared to where you have a solid wall where it creates a, a, the pressure differential between the subsurface and indoor air. That's a very important point. Uh, we didn't have, we were working for a consultant who didn't really investigate that question at that specific site, but it's a really important point and I would predict that we would see that at certain sites. And if I may add something regarding one of the initial questions that Frank asked uh, to Peter, uh, indoor sources. Indoor sources actually in my personal experience are, can be very challenging and important. I remember years ago uh, at a conference there was a, a college, I think he works for Eli Aldridge, uh, Rich Rago, uh, I think he's based in Connecticut or uh, somewhere up in the Northeast. And he has a picture of his own garage with a, you know, cleaning products uh, and all different things. And in the next slide, there are all the chemi arrows with the chemicals from each uh, uh, product. And they, they are, uh, he had benzene, toluene, a, 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 ethyl benzene, uh, xylene, naphthalene, uh, tetrahydrofor, and acetone, uh, MAC, uh, diethyl ether, uh, and a bunch of other things, including uh, TCE and PCE. Uh, what another, uh, you know, Personal note, uh, recently in the Bay Area, a consultant were 
doing a, during investigation, they found TCE. They could not figure out, because it was not in the subsurface, why it was there. It turned out that it was in a um, bear spray can, and it was a, listed as an inactive ingredient, so it was not on the label, but that can was 90% TCE. So things are where you don't expect them to be, and if they're listed uh, by the producer, the manufacturer as non-active um, ingredient may not be even on the label. You have to go look at the, more, at the spec in uh, more in detail. If I may, this is Mark again. Uh, when the doors are closed, you can often be, you can recognize if there's an indoor source because the building acts like a flux chamber and you'll see a slow increase of concentration. And then when the doors are open again, you see it drop out. We've seen that many times. I, I can speak, uh, I give a whole hour lecture on many of the sites where we've seen those patterns. Mm. Okay, um, I hope at the next RemTech 2021, maybe you can give this one hour lecture, uh, Mark. That would be good. <laughs> <Yeah>? I will. <laughs> uh, let's skip to the final speaker of today, uh, the duo Duncan and Kierwa. Um, Jose, any questions maybe for Duncan or Kierwa? Actually, I have a question for Claudio. For Claudio, um, okay. come back to Claudio. I, 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 yeah, so uh, I, I want to know if uh, there are any specific in California guidance for analytical sourcing and identification of VOC inside to the buildings. Uh, say it again, analytical, I could not understand the word that you said after Source, analytical. Sourcing, sourcing and identification uh, of VOCs, especially to differentiate uh, VOCs from regular products that we use it in our residence from uh, uh, sub superficial sources of uh, there is not a guidance uh, uh, you know depending on uh, how much you know on the resources available there are people who use uh, uh, portable gcms like the frog or other uh, instrument of the source so you can uh, you know otherwise you can use a pid if the source is uh, particularly significant once you identify uh, you know, uh, we had cases in which actually uh, chemicals were off gas in uh, building materials. Uh, other way, but no, the short answer, there is not a guidance. I've seen uh, sometimes using uh, um, combined specific isotopic analysis, if you have the same contaminant to distinguish between uh, uh, subsurface and indoor air, the detection limit there, I mean, how much uh, the concentration you have to have in the indoor air can be a challenge. Not to, I mean, in the, in the, usually in the subsurface you have enough, but in the indoor air, uh, not necessarily. But that's another avenue you can distinguish whether the PC is coming from uh, the dry cleaner next door or uh, from uh, one of the, you know, uh, from the uh, clothes that you're hanging the uh, closet after dry cleaning. <laughs> Okay. If I could jump in real quick, to, uh, Jose, um, we've looked at ratios of compounds to one another. So if if you have to if you happen to have cis DCE uh, in your indoor air and in the sub slab, you can take that ratio, and that's your attenuation factor essentially. If then you take your other compounds and look to their ratios between the sub slab and the indoor air and see different uh, uh, constant, you know, different ratios, that's a good indicator that you have an indoor source. So we, we, we see that a lot for benzene. Um, in, in the States, we love to keep our, our gasoline in the house with us and, and it, it leaks into the <laughs> indoor air space and, and yeah. so there's a lot of benzene in the house and, and that's how we can sort those out. Well, okay. that works if you have a single source in the subsurface, say for, for larger sites in which you have commingled plume and you have a, a higher degree of a spatial heterogeneity that can, you know, can be informative, but not as much as if you have a single source. Thanks a lot, Claudio, for all these additions. Um, I think we can continue for a bit longer on this discussion, but the time is lacking. Uh, then uh, again, I would like to go to Duncan and Kiara. Uh, I have one question for you, uh, Duncan and Kiara. Um, what about droplets? Are, 
droplets, all droplets the same, or is there a difference between persons and situations? How do you deal with, with, with the different droplets in, in your investigations? Um, I'd like uh, Frank to invite uh, Mike Carl to answer the question as he is our expert uh, in uh, ventilation performance. And you, I can yeah. see him uh, on the webcam now. Would you like to answer the question, Mike? Yeah, so if I understand the question correctly, um, basically when you have someone coughing or sneezing or just talking regularly, um, there's going to be difference in the distribution of the size of droplets that are released. Um, and Duncan showed a couple of curves that uh, showed how, how, the, how those droplet sizes um, are distributed for different events. And then the other big factor is going to be when you have a cough or, or a sneeze, sneeze in particular, you're going to have many more droplets in total being released. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we're starting to understand about uh, the COVID-19 is just also even just talking normally like I am right now versus singing or shouting is also releasing different amounts of droplets with yeah. the more I'm shouting or singing, I'm, I'm releasing a lot more droplets. Um, so really, so the droplets themselves, they're, they're different sizes and the distribution of those sizes varies by the type of event that's occurring and the total amount of droplets that's being released also varies by the type of event that's occurring. What about men and women and children? Do they all yeah. have uh, all the droplets? So, so a child, for example, will, um, if a child is just breathing normally, first off, they're not going, their lungs are smaller, so they're not going to be exchanging as much air as an adult. And also they're not going to be generating as much um, of, as many droplets as an adult mm -hmm. doing the same activity. So okay. it, it does, it does vary by the person and by the, um, and by the activity. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions uh, about the COVID droplets uh, from one of the chairman or one of the contributors? Uh, I just put a question in the chat uh, and uh, regards uh, how much the climatic differences in uh, air temperature and humidity can uh, affect uh, or have an impact on uh, uh, evaporation and deposition rate of the droplets? And in specifically, do you think things are going to get worse uh, in the winter compared to uh, the, um, a dry and uh, hot summer? So this is a big subject right now. Um, I don't know that we have all, I don't know that all the data is out just yet, but I can speak to a couple of things that um, some of the learnings that, that, that I've been reading about. Um, it seems like um, hotter and higher humidity um, is a challenge for the virus. Um, a lot of recommendations for the indoor environment, even in the winter time, is to keep the relative humidity between 40-50%. Um, in the summertime, stretching that uh, to 40-60%, to going a little bit higher in the summertime. The reason in the wintertime not going as high as 60% relative humidity is you can cause other problems like condensation and things like that on, uh, on surfaces that lead to mold and other things that, that we don't want. Um, we, I don't know that we, that there's enough out there to really speak to the seasonality. Um, I know we think a lot about seasonality with infectious diseases like cold and flu season. Um, it, it doesn't appear to me like we have that information yet um, for, for the coronavirus for COVID-19. Um, because not really about the virus itself, it's about the uh, droplets, uh, you know, the drier the uh, condition are, the, okay, and the so, hotter yeah. the you, you, are, you know, you, it's easy to imagine that you will evaporate faster. Yeah, you will. So I, there was a plot that, that from, from Duncan's presentation that showed, yeah, the effect of if, if you have a low relative humidity and a high temperature, you're going to uh, not only evaporate faster, but you, the air can handle or you, you can evaporate more of the, of the droplets into the air itself. Yes, that's true. 
I so have, and, uh, yeah, I have a final question about the droplets. Uh, then we have to more or less close down. Uh, that is uh, a question from the chat from Marco Falconi. And uh, Marco is worried about the students. Uh, he, his question is, are the students protected during class? Okay, so that is a really big question. Um, that's got a lot of different components to it. Uh, so there's the public policy component. Yeah, and I know we're, I know we're over time. So I'll, I'll just acknowledge that there are a lot of different components to it. And it's going to depend on what is happening in the community. That's a big component of what, what the infection rates are in the community. And that will relate to the public policy side to decide whether classes should be in person or online. Again, that's very regional and um, a public policy issue. Um, as far as there are, are students in the building, it's about reducing risk um, rather than absolute protection. So things like wearing masks, um, looking at the class sizes uh, to limit the number of students that are, that are in, um, in, a, in a class, um, physical distancing where it's possible, and then to start to look at the ventilation system as well. And schools have a wide range. Many of them are very old. Some of them are very new in what, in what the ventilation system can do. Um, so it becomes a matter of sort of recommissioning and returning it back on. Um, there are lots of guidance related to that from organizations like ASHRAE. Um, and then you need to be looking at the individual situation itself, making sure that you're meeting those minimum air requirements um, by places, from places like ASHRAE or RIVA. Um, and then looking at things like increasing filtration, um, bringing in portable uh, HEPA filters or or other types of filtration devices, things that are probably more on adding to as opposed to fundamentally changing the ventilation system because that can be very costly and um, okay expensive yeah. for yeah. So I'll I'll, I'll leave it at that. Very very <laughs> complex question. Um, so I know I know. Thanks a lot for stepping in for Duncan. Uh, you. Uh, I realize it's late, but I have one question I really need to ask. Uh, and I would like to have an answer from all of you, a very short answer, maybe for at most one minute. Uh, it is a question you maybe uh, might hate me for, I don't know, I take the risk. Uh, you proposed highly sophisticated procedures uh, on measurement technologies. I want to know from each of you, do you also believe in calculations of vapor intrusion? Uh, this was all about measurement. What is your opinion about measurement, uh, calculations, models of vapor intrusion? Please, a very short answer. Peter, please. Yeah, I think there, a lot of uh, vapor intrusion is at the moment being modeled uh, because we have too little measurements. I think a combination of both. If you do more measurements, you can do a more accurate modeling. So I think there is a power in the combination of both. Okay, Mark? I got a two pronged answer. One is uh, the use of a default attenuation factor like in California. I think that it's great that they're conservative because we really don't know and we wanna be protective. Secondly, I've never seen a model that fit the data. So we've gone to many sites where predictions were made based on soil vapor results and in indoors we never ever saw the results be accurate. But they usually overestimate. So as a first tier, it could be useful. Sometimes they over, sometimes they under. It's really a, like a snowflake. Okay. Every building's like a snowflake. Okay. Craig and Laurie, what's your opinion <laughs> about modeling of vapor intrusion? Well, if you look back at the history of vapor intrusion and the assessment, the first rule when, when vapor intrusion started was never go inside, avoid going inside at all costs. And so we had to have some way to predict that. And so that's why the models were developed. But I'm with Mark, the, the attenuation factors, uh, you, you don't know the attenuation factor of any one building. It's different for every building. So applying the model in that way uh, is not a good fit. Yeah, and we've had some ASTM standards where if you go through their list, 
they've said we don't have a vapor intrusion problems and we actually do. Yeah, okay. so it's, it's, I think it can be misleading. Yeah. Yes. Okay, okay. We could talk hours for this, so it's very frustrating <laughs> to be short, but it is the end of the session. Uh, what about you, Claudio? Can you say a few words about that? Well, yes. Uh, as I said in my presentation, uh, uh, real the empirical data beats the model any day of the week. Uh, so, but and there's uh, a famous uh, quote from uh, George Box, the statistician: "All models are wrong; some are useful." Uh, <laughs> That's good. That's a good one. That's a good one. Almost actually, we should end now. Say no, no word anymore. But we still uh, have to go to Kiara. Kiara, do you have anything to say? Was it difficult for you to talk for Duncan here? Well, uh, as you know, we our topic is a little different. Uh, uh, maybe uh, Mike yeah. can comment on uh, how much we believe on modeling in general and uh, how much we think it is right or useful to rely on mo modeling. Uh, yeah, maybe. and I'll leave the, the the main commentary to to the other experts on this panel um, and. I, I had one thing I was going to say that I thought was was going to be great, and then Claudio said it, um, which was mm -hmm. the bit about um, all models are wrong, but but some of them are useful. Well, again, it's not my quote. Uh, is uh, George Box? Yeah. I think we stop here. The final conclusion is that uh, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. Mm -hmm. I like that as an ending of the session. Uh, I would like to thank the speakers uh, again. Uh, I think we had an uh, extremely interesting uh, session. I learned a lot from it. Uh, very stimulating uh, and a very good uh, end of the, of the Thursday uh, RamTech 2020. Thank you very much, uh, all of the speakers. Thank uh, you. The, the thank you, everybody. Thing, yes, the final thing I'd like to say is that tomorrow morning, uh, Rentech starts again at nine o'clock uh, with another interesting session, and that is on effluents and wastewaters challenges in managing odors and micropollutants. Hope to see you back tomorrow. All have a good evening, good afternoon, or good evening or good morning. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye, bye everybody. Bye. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Ciao. All speakers, thank you very much. Bye, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Marco. Thank you, Marco. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Marco. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye, all. Bye.